last week we began to consider together the Sermon on the Mount as we find it in Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7. And last week we simply overviewed the whole sermon. We considered together that it is one of the most important passages in the Word of God. I suggested to you that this passage is just as important as, for example, the great epistle to the Romans or the epistle to the Ephesians. It is not so doctrinal, it is experiential and practical, but it is a passage of fundamental importance to each Christian believer. This sermon is about the Kingdom of God and it shows to us the moral and spiritual character of those who belong to God's Kingdom. It is a character which is completely unobtainable by nature. The Lord Jesus tells us that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And quite simply, it is not possible to the natural man, to the natural woman, it is not possible for them to be the kind of person that is described here and to live the kind of life that is described. We also saw that this sermon deals with the standards by which the citizens of God's kingdoms are to live and those standards are wholly different from the standards of this world. And we considered that this is a sermon which demands our constant attention. It is not a sermon simply to be read through once and then say, yes, I've read the Sermon on the Mount. It is a sermon that we need to return to time and time and time again. I suggested to you that even though I strongly commend and urge upon you the practice of reading systematically through the whole Bible, yet nevertheless this sermon is too important only to read each time that you read through the Bible. It is a sermon that we need to study and meditate upon constantly. Well, the sermon begins with what we term the Beatitudes. These various sayings of Jesus beginning with the term blessed or in plainer language simply happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn, etc. Now of course everyone is interested in happiness. That is natural to us as human beings. Nobody desires to be unhappy. We all desire happiness. But sinful men and women, such as we are, have distorted ideas about what happiness consists in. In the language of Isaiah the prophet, we spend money on what is not bread. We spend our labor on what does not satisfy. We seek happiness and yet we seek it in the wrong places. There are many people who have their ideas about what would make them happy. Wealth health, success in business, a happy marriage, having a nice house, having a good car, being able to go on long overseas vacations. These are the things that would make them happy. Or at least so they think. 
We have many examples, of course, that we read about from time to time in the newspapers of men and women who have obtained just these things. They have obtained celebrity and fame and wealth and so on, and then they commit suicide. Or then they attend Alcoholics Anonymous or a drug rehabilitation unit and we discover that it hasn't made them happy at all. There's nothing new about this. Listen to the writer of the Old Testament writing in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 4 I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines the delight of the children of man. Verse 11, Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity, and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Now the Bible encourages us to seek happiness. But it encourages us to seek true happiness and to seek it where it may be found. And for men and women made in the image of God, true happiness is to be found in God and in God alone. Many years ago, St. Augustine prayed in these terms, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And the Bible tells us that we can never experience true and lasting happiness until we have peace with God and are brought into the kingdom of God and of Christ. Again and again, the Bible pronounces blessedness upon those who know God and who serve him in his kingdom. Listen to a selection of them. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law he meditates day and night. Blessed is that man. Psalm 2 verse 12, Blessed are all who take refuge in him, that is Christ. Psalm 32, Blessed is the person whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Psalm 40, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Psalm 112, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Psalm 119, too, Blessed are those who keep God's testimonies, who seek him, with their whole heart. And then right at the very end of the Bible, just a few verses from the last. Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter into the city, the city of God, the kingdom of God, by the gates. These are the people whom the Bible pronounces to be blessed. Those who know God, those who serve God, 
those who love God, those who keep the commandments of God. And here in the passage before us, nine times in the course of a few verses, Jesus describes the truly happy person. And notice that his description is entirely unrelated to their bank balance, to their earthly success and prosperity, and it has everything to do with their moral and spiritual character, their relationship with God and with the people of God. And Jesus is telling us what the rest of the Bible has already been telling us, that happiness consists in knowing and serving God in his kingdom. Now, notice please that these Beatitudes form a unity. These are not simply a motley collection of random sayings. These all describe the same people. We are not to think that some people are poor in spirit and they are happy. Others are meek and they are happy. Others are pure in heart and they are happy and so on. What we have here is an all-round description of the same people. They are the same people who are poor in spirit, meek, merciful, pure in heart and so on. They are the one body of people. And we can see that very clearly from the blessings which are pronounced upon them. Because essentially, all these blessings are the same. Verse 3, theirs is the kingdom of God. And verse 5, they shall inherit the earth. Perhaps it might be better to translate that, they shall inherit the land. It's a reference to the Old Testament covenant with Abraham, the promised land. They will inherit the promises of God. And of course they will inherit them in the kingdom of God. They shall be filled, filled with righteousness in the kingdom of God. They shall obtain mercy. They shall see God. They shall be called sons of God. These are not completely separate things, they are simply different aspects of the one reality of Christian salvation, being brought into God's kingdom. So all these descriptions are describing the same people, and notice also that there is a definite order in these descriptions. The Christian is first of all someone who has been humbled before God, verses 3 to 5, poor in spirit, mourning, meek. Then he is someone who is seeking. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he is someone who finds and begins to bear the fruit of righteousness in his life. Mercy, purity of heart, peacemaking. And then because of all these things, because of what these people are and what they do in this fallen world, they experience persecution. And so in these verses, we have a very careful structure describing the experience of the Christian. And notice that what we have here primarily is a description of what the Christian is rather than a description of what the Christian does. We must be very clear that the Sermon on the Mount is not just a set of laws. It's not just a set of rules. And Jesus is saying to people, okay, here are the rules, you just follow these rules and all will be well. That is a complete misunderstanding of the Sermon on the Mount. Primarily, before being concerned about what...